In the 21 years between the world wars, many nations devoted a great deal of effort to new machine gun designs. Their hope was to have a machine gun that would be more mobile than the water-cooled and yet give up as few of its advantages as possible. I do not want to cover the history of weapons development during those 21 years. Instead, I'll compare two designs, the MG-34 and the BAR. I'll cover the characteristics which resulted from their design and then show how each army incorporated that weapon into its tactical organization and doctrine. According to this chart, one would say that the MG-34, with its higher volume of fire, is obviously the superior weapon. Well, I'm not so sure. Let's take a look. This is the German MG-34. It weighs 26 and a half pounds and can be carried by one man. It feeds from this metallic, non-disintegrating belt. This belt must be recovered by the crew and reloaded with ammunition after use. Unlike the Maxim and Browning cloth belts, these belts lay on top of the cartridges in the feedway. The bolt drives the cartridge forward, down, and out of the belt into the chamber. The weapon operates on the short recoil principle, which you have seen before. It does not have water cooling, so it employs two other things in order to dissipate the heat generated by sustained fire. First, it fires from the open bolt so that when the weapon is not actually firing, air can circulate through the barrel. Secondly, it has a quick change barrel. When a barrel becomes overheated, it need only be exchanged for a cool one. The MG-34 and BAR will make the same target run. When displacing between engagements, three surprise targets will appear at 50 yards.
some disadvantages of the MG-34 become immediately apparent. Though the weapon can be carried by one man, it is not single man portable. That high volume of fire is predicated upon the quick change barrel for dissipation of heat. There has to be an assistant gunner for carrying spare barrels in the spare parts kit. At the volume of fire shown on the chart, the crew has to change the barrel once every minute. Since it consumes more ammunition, an ammo bearer is needed. It takes a while for the crew to get the weapon into and out of position. You saw the confusion as the emergency targets were initially engaged by the assistant gunner with his rifle. He knew the machine gun simply couldn't open fire in time. Since our targets don't actually kill people, the crew then went ahead and engaged them with the MG-34. This weapon can be fired in an emergency, as you see in this photograph. I'm not so sure, however, that I would like to be the assistant gunner who carries it over my shoulder while the gunner behind me blazes away. The MG-34 was difficult to control. You should have noticed that it had a large beaten zone. The extremely high cyclic rate, over 800 rounds per minute, does not help this. Since it is a short recoil weapon, nearly one-third the weight of the weapon is moving after every shot, making it even more difficult to control and recoil. However, this is what the German wanted, for in the squad he saw the MG-34 as an area suppression weapon. Another disadvantage of its high cyclic rate is that the part velocity is higher. If the bolt has to travel backward and forward 800 times per minute rather than say 500 times per minute, then the bolt's acceleration and deceleration at the beginning of each forward and back motion is that much more violent and abrupt. This breaks parts and places a premium on clean, high quality ammunition. Partway through engaging the first set of targets, the MG-34 extractor tore through a cartridge case. The crew had to change barrels in order to continue. Normally, one of the assistant gunners would have used the tool kit to clear that barrel. Otherwise, the barrels were changed only when overheated. Wherever possible, the Germans set up the machine gun on the tripod. This helped stabilize the weapon and gave it a smaller beaten zone. Further, its traversing and elevating mechanism aided in the adjustment of long-range fire. The tripod was a heavy, clumsy affair, but it was always carried with the machine gun. You do not see German combat photography of the MG-34 without a tripod or an observer with binoculars to assist in the adjustment of long-range fire. This is the proper way to employ a crew-served weapon. The gunner adjusts sights, aims, and fires the weapon, and the assistant gunner keeps it working. Somebody else must spot the fall of the rounds. Without this, the effective range of the machine gun is no more than 1,000 yards. Secondly, you will never see German soldiers carrying belts of machine gun ammunition festooned across their chests like the Frito Bandido. They always carried their ammunition in the can and fed it directly from the can into the machine gun. This kept the ammo clean and the belts free of rust and was essential for reliable operation. The MG-34 pays a price for its volume of fire. With its spare barrels and tripod, it weighs roughly three quarters what a water-cooled machine gun weighed. It is slow to place in position. It still takes a four-man crew to carry it and extract from it its potential volume of fire and combat range. To a German, none of this was a disadvantage. His tactical organization was based on this machine gun. This is the breakdown of the German squad. It is plain that the German squad was designed for fire and movement. The machine gun would lay down a base of fire. While it was suppressing the enemy, the remainder of the squad would maneuver about, and when the range was proper, they would go in with grenades, rifle fire, and the bayonet. 
This is the system that took Iban Imal and Paris and got to the banks of the Volga River. The Browning automatic rifle of World War II was a beefed up and bipod equipped version of the BAR of World War I. The BAR weighs 18 pounds with its bipod and feeds from a 20 round detachable staggered double column box magazine. It does not have a quick change barrel, though it does fire from the open bolt in order to help cool the weapon. It is equipped with a bipod to help stabilize the weapon during automatic fire from the prone position. The selector switch gave two different cyclic rates of fire, 500 rounds per minute and 350 rounds per minute, both of them fully automatic. Let's see what the BAR can do with the same target array that you saw before. It is quite obvious that the BAR does not have the sustained volume of fire of the MG-34. However, a couple of other things are equally obvious. The BAR can truly be carried and operated by one man. The weapon can be put in action as fast as any individual infantryman's rifle. It is certainly as accurate as the MG-34 when fired from the bipod. Its lower cyclic rate of fire and a few other characteristics reduce movement of the weapon during firing and the beaten zone is relatively small. On a suppression target, the BAR was slightly less capable. A well-trained gunner could still put rounds in the target area and still kill or suppress the individuals there. However, he only had 20 rounds to do the job and there was a distinct break in firing for changing magazines. Because it is a fixed barrel weapon, the volume of fire must be voluntarily held down. The weapon can be fired at more than 80 rounds per minute, but if it is, the barrel will rapidly overheat. Severe overheating burns out the barrel and may even warp the receiver. All of these disadvantages made little difference. The American squad was not primarily organized around the BAR. 
It was in the squad in order to beef up the squad's overall volume of fire. If the squad wanted to, it could of course use the BAR as a suppression weapon and maneuver about it. But the BAR was never really intended to operate separately from the remaining members of the squad and never intended as a general purpose weapon. At platoon, company, and battalion level, other machine guns, the Browning air-cooled, the Browning water-cooled, and the Browning 50 caliber heavy barrel were present in order to fill the suppression role or the base of fire role. When the American squad did maneuver against the enemy under the covering fire of platoon or company level machine guns, then the squad's semi-automatic Durand rifles and the BAR gave them a great advantage over a German squad. Not only was the squad's volume of fire much higher, but if the maneuvering squad was caught in a position where they needed long-range automatic fire, they still had a weapon that could get the job done. Each weapon, the BAR and the MG-34, had its own very unique set of characteristics, advantages, and disadvantages. Each weapon, when woven into the tactical organization and when coupled with the fire of other weapons, contributed to the success of their respective armies. Which is better? Neither. The intelligent leader used these weapons in concert with his other weapons in order to make an unbeatable team. The design trade-offs which you saw here are not unlike the design trade-offs in weapons which you use today. The basic concepts for the use of these weapons have not changed. The German soldier properly employed his MG-34 during World War II, and the American properly employed his BAR. We expect the same of you today.